Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, and we just want to welcome everyone to our Sunday school hour here, and I'd like to ask you this morning, if you would please, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 3 as we continue our study in Romans. And as we start this morning, it's a blessing to have Norm with us, and I'd like to ask you, Norm, if you'd open us in a word of prayer, please, this morning, brother. Amen. Our scripture reading is going to be in chapter 3, verse 21, through the end of the chapter, if you're not already there. Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? Is it excluded? By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith, and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Father, we just ask your blessing upon this study here this morning. We ask that everything that's said and done would honor and glorify you. And we thank you for your precious word and for this precious section specifically. And we ask you to just bless it with, with, uh, with all that's done here this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. You know, as we've had our study thus far, we've seen that the purpose of the law, we need to realize, what, what do we know? Well, it, it wasn't, the purpose of the law was never to save, but rather it was, it was to condemn. And we've spent numbers of weeks now, from about the mid part of chapter 1 until this part of chapter 3, of seeing how without any, any way that, that man can save himself. In the study of Romans to this point, we've seen how the man is lost with no hope, that there's, there's, no, that there's no hope for man. If you're a Jew, we've seen how the Bible says that there's no excuse for it. And he talks about how uh, the innate knowledge that that man has of himself, of knowing God, as well as the very very nature of everything, the universe itself, how it it proclaims him. We've seen how the just of the, the, uh, the, the, the moralist, the one that thinks that he is basically a very moral man, a very righteous man, living in his own righteousness, proclaiming his own righteousness of himself as being self-righteous, is also just as lost, if not more lost, than another. Typically, we see that. And then we saw the Jew and how the Bible has told us that with that, we see that with, with the Scriptures. They actually had the Scriptures. They had the oracles of God. So there's without excuse. And if we just go back for a moment as we set this up this morning, we're going to be looking at, at this wonderful chapter at the wonderful part of our chapter, because this is a major change that we're going to be looking at here this morning. Looking in Romans 3.19, we read, Now we know that, what's the, now we know that, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them which are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no man be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. We see very quickly that basically it's like you know, that it's talking about when men go before God, they can't even open their mouth. They, they're so, there's nothing they can say. There's no defense at all for it. And we see that the reason for this is they're all guilty before God. And we see that the reason for sin was is to bring knowledge of the sins that there are. We saw how the Lord had brought those three witnesses we talked about, and we just talked about those. But we could sum all of this up with this very simple phrase. Very simply saying, man is guilty. 
Man is guilty, isn't he? There is no way that, that anyone in and of themselves can save themselves. We are lost and without hope. And a man needs to realize that. No man is worthy or ever will be. And all are lost and without hope in and of themselves. But you know, my friends, God cannot lower his standard, can he? He cannot lower who he is or be less than he is. We know that righteousness literally can have no fellowship with unrighteousness, can it? No, there is, there is no, no way. If God is to save men from ruin and sin, it must be in a way that, does not, that actually does not violate his, his own holiness. And we have to remember that Romans itself, the specific gospel, sets forth the doctrine of justification by faith and all of its ramifications in a systematic way. Righteousness is the very theme of this epistle, isn't it? Righteousness, we want to keep that focus in mind. Now, beginning in verse, as we look now at verse 21, where our real study here begins this morning, he says, but now, that's the biggest two words, but now, there's a major dispensational shift that he's going to be talking about. We're going to learn a lot about the dispensations, literally through our next five chapters, to this and the next, uh, about five more chapters, but it's what a wonderful thing. But now, Mark's a great transition it's like moving from darkness, we would say, into light, but even more so in this case. The but now is going to talk about something that is really great and wonderful that's about to take place as we look into the Scriptures. This section is the very heart of the book of Romans. The very heart of it. Some have su suggested, such as uh, McLean, that these, may be, these next six verses may be the most important in all of Scripture. He, can, he said that if he was on a desert island and he could only have six verses, this is the six he would want. He considers them some of the most. And most commentators I read had the same thing to say. Very, very important. Now look at verses, uh, we're getting in verse 21 again. Let's look at this. It says, but now the righteousness, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness, for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus Christ. Those are some powerful words, aren't they? Did you notice how many times we've heard the word righteousness? Four different times. It basically gives a little outline here. Verse 21, the righteousness. Then we have verse 22, even the righteousness. Verse 25, to declare his righteousness. And then in verse 26 is to declare, again, his righteousness, but we add, at this time. Yes, his righteousness. Now, if we go back to verse 21 again and look at this, we want to see something. That God's plan is always fully scriptural, isn't it? God does not violate His Word, does He? It's always consistent. We need to understand dispensational truth, though, and we'll be getting into that in our study as well. Maybe not this morning so much. But we need to think about these things. His plan is scriptural. Remember that when we look at things, we need to understand that, that particularly the New Testament, uh, we have many what the Bible calls mysteries. What's a mystery in the Bible? A mystery is something that is a truth that was simply unknown or completely revealed before. Now, it doesn't mean there weren't, if you go back after you know the mystery and you look into the Old Testament, boom, it kind of comes pretty clear that, wow, yes, they, were, they, they had types and shadows of it, didn't they? We think of their sacrifices, types and shadows of what? Of Christ, right? All pointing to, to the Savior. All of these things are true. But we see that, that there's no contradiction in here, which has happened from times that people will suggest. It, confirm, it actually conforms to the standards of the law. God cannot lower his standards. His plan will not and must not violate the right, his righteous demands. 
The Old Testament, we want to realize, was both a moral, had a moral and, 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 cer- and the ceremonial laws. The moral law was designed to uncover sin. The ceremonial law was designed to provide temporary cover for the sinner that was exposed. But notice it can only cover sin. The Old Testament, it only covered sin. We want to keep that in mind. It was never complete. It it required a continuous sacrifice by blood of bulls and goats, lambs, etc. We see that. Do we do that today? I wonder why. We're in a different time, aren't we? There's a different thing. Thus, when we look at this, we can see this. But now, God's plan, as revealed in the gospel, upholds the righteousness of God, as revealed in the moral law, and provides a complete cleansing from sin. When I say complete, what do I mean? All sin. All sin. All sin. Once and for all. Once and for all. When our Lord finished His work, as we won't go into this too much this morning, but He sat down. Now that's significant. And what's significant about that? Well, we think of the Old Testament, we think of the temple, right? Beautiful, magnificent temple. I mean, it was fabulous. But you know what you couldn't find in the temple? Yeah, there we go. Where's the chair? Why couldn't we find a chair? Because their work was never done, right? But when Jesus Christ finished His work once, what did He do? He he ascended up on high and He sat down on the right hand of God. It's a finished work complete in every way. Now, most of us, and a lot of us, um, you know, thankfully, we understand this to a great extent. But I think the goodness of this study is it's always blessed my heart. A lot of people that know me in the past used to say Romans was my book because I always love Romans so much. But the point was is that we can learn so much about this dispensation through what Paul is going to share with us now as we get into this section of the study. You see, God's plan of salvation comforts us too. Notice that it says, or or, 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 I should say actually conforms too, to, to the fact that it was both witnessed by the prophets and the law, as we see. Isaiah 53 reminds us of the substitutionary death of Christ on our behalf. In verse 6 in, in Isaiah 53, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. The Lord had laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Oh, do we not have from Isaiah in the Old Testament telling us what was going to happen? That there was going to come one that was going to take all of our sins and pay for all of that iniquity for us? And it was going to be to account of our righteousness through Christ, as we see in 53.11, when he goes on to say, he shall, see, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Who's the he speaking of? Basically, God the Father, right? God the Father shall see the travail of his son's soul and shall be satisfied. His knowledge shall my righteous servant justify, but by, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. What's he saying? That they're going to be saved through him. That that's going to happen there. Yes, we see this. And we can kind of see this one commentator put it like this. He says, it's as if our Lord is looking down upon his pain and suffering. And he'll look upon it as joy joy and pleasure and is satisfied. He's being satisfied with this. We know he is. I think this is very poorly done, but it kind of gives an example. He says, as a woman forgets her former pain and anguish in childbirth. What happens? So Christ, after all his sorrow and sufferings, sees a large number of souls regenerated, sanctified, justified, and brought to heaven which is a most pleasing and satisfying sight to him. In other words, it was worth it all. Was it worth it? Those are pretty poor words, really, aren't they? They're they're from our standpoint. God knew from all eternity. We can't understand his... We really can't fully comprehend his love and compassion for us. 
in knowing truly who he is in that sense. But it is unbelievable to think that this is a that God would step out of heaven. Jesus Christ would come into this world as he did and pay a price that we could never pay for ourselves as unworthy as we were. And he did it. And as humiliating as it was, for your sake and for my sake, and it was just for even one of us, if that's all that there was to be. What an amazing God. And it's so much ours. You know, he's righteous. Because of the holiness of his nature and the righteousness of his life as a man and because of his faithful discharge of his work and his office as a mediator and because he is the author and the bringer of the everlasting righteousness by which he justifies his people. Yes, that is, acquits and absolves them, pronounces them righteous and frees them from from condemnation and death. If you're here as a child this morning, do we understand that we truly are already saved? Already. We, in that sense, we have already been made righteous before God the very moment we were saved. Yes. That is, acquits, absolves them, and pronounces them righteous and free from the condemnation of death. He is the procuring and meritorious cause of their justification. His righteousness is the matter of it all in him as the head, and they are justified by him. You see, it's clear that this plan of God for making sinners righteous apart from the law or human merit is thoroughly scripture, isn't it? Scriptural. Now, we, they, we, that, we, we didn't even hardly skim the, the surface of where we could go in the Old Testament. And through our studies, probably over the next months, we'll see more and more Scripture with the Old Testament coming in. There's a, so much Old Testament showing it in types and shadows of what's going to come. And by God's grace, Paul, as God has appointed him, like a great lawyer, a super lawyer, a divine lawyer, we might even say, because he's got divine help with it, doesn't he? Unveils the mind and the purpose of all that is through his gospel. And that's what we're going to have the, 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 the pleasure of seeing by God's grace. Yes, apart from the law, it isn't the righteousness of God is revealed apart from the Old Testament, but rather it reveals apart from the principle of the law. And notice the law isn't done away with in one sense. It, the principle of the law is done away with. It is apart from a legal relationship, from a legal relationship to God based on the idea of earning or deserving merit, merit before God. And this is an important thing. I know most of us in here will know this, but I'm going to emphasize a lot of it this morning because I'm going to have to say a lot don't. A lot of people don't. In a lot of churches, you won't find that. This is a truth that's so overlooked and so important. And it's grace versus works. Grace versus works. Yes, we need to see this. You see, some will think of God's grace, His righteousness, is something to kind of take up a little slack in their life. In other words, I know that, you know, Lord, I'm a pretty good guy. I am a pretty righteous fellow. I do pretty, but you know, I am missing the mark. I can't quite get there. I'm not there all the way. So I need your righteousness to come in and help me with where mine is so I can go the rest of the way. I don't think that's right. Certainly doesn't go with God's word, does it? But how many people kind of think like that? They kind of see it like fixing up the old house. It needs pain. It needs to be, you know, the wire and all. Everything needs to be redone. A lot of things need to be fixed and it needs to be fixed back up, made look nice again. That's not right. But that's the way many people see it. It's, it's, not to give, it's not given to supplement our own righteousness. It's given completely apart from our own attempt at righteousness, isn't it? We see this, and we can very quickly see this. If we look in Romans 3.10. 
when it says, as it is written, there is what? None righteous, no, not one. That is about as clear as it can get, isn't it? There is none righteous, no, not one. Is there any good thing in me? We've seen that in our study. Am I now a better, better me because I believe in the righteousness being added to my own righteousness? Again, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We are new. We are indwelt with the Holy Spirit now. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Our salvation is through the power of God to everyone that believeth. How hard is it to be saved? Well, I've only read the Bible 15 times. I got hit 25 before I'm going to get saved. Yeah, that's what the, there's somewhere yet that said that. Didn't it say that somewhere? I've got to be extremely not. What do you have to be to be saved? You have to, that's right. Very good. And that's what the first part of our studies over the last weeks have been about. The, our lost condition. And what sin is. And understanding how we are all lost. And that's what we need to get to first. And then the second part is recognizing that in and of ourselves there is no good thing. And we need a Savior. Yes. Our salvation is through the power of God to everyone that believeth. In Romans 1, 16, going back there, a beautiful area of Romans when it says in Romans 1, 16, Paul cries out and he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, now, of course, in his time, it was easy to be a Christian, wasn't it? They weren't being thrown in jail, persecuted, or anything like that, were they? Sure they were. Paul was thrown in jail how many different times, and did he not give his life eventually for the gospel? Yes. It was a hard time to be a Christian. But he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because in Christ himself, he knows, he knows right then that he is sure of eternal life. He knows that sin no longer has power in his life. Nor death has no power. He is completely sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his desire to do everything for him. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We have that combination, the two coming together again. Well, we get into the book of Romans. It's important to see this. We're all in this dispensation. We all saved the same way. But we also see this is a truly just the power of God that puts us into those positions. And then in verse 17, it goes on to say, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We went into a great deal in our study of that many months, uh, probably about a month or so ago. But remember, it's through faith that we're saved, isn't it? And then also, what's the other faith? The faith is the living and the walking out of our salvation, isn't it? We're to live by that same faith. So let us consider righteousness apart from the law. As we've said, it's the theme of the epistle of uh, the whole epistle of Romans. But it is really, many believe, much more. Much more. In reality, is the theme of the whole Bible. Righteousness apart from the law. It's righteousness apart from human doing. Righteousness apart from man's deserving. And righteousness in giving freely to those that do not deserve it. Righteousness stems... Forth from the heart of God, because it is simply the nature of his being. As we kind of alluded to just a little earlier, when we talked about how can God, for someone as unworthy as I am, pay such a price or do what he does for me, it's because it's in his nature to do that. It's in his nature to do that. Just as it's in his nature when he, when he was uh, tested, as we know, for that 40 days in the wilderness. Some said, well, he could have chosen to, to sin, but he didn't. That's not true. 
He can't sin. Why? Because he's God. It's against his nature. It's not even a part of his being to sin. It's not even a part of anything he can do or would do because it's not his nature. And that's what we need to think about when we think of God. Yes, this is the theme of the Word of God. But let us beware. There are many counterfeits. And in some ways, we can even say they're easy to detect. How are they easy to detect? Real easy. You always have to do something. Okay? If you're going to be saved, you need to come to church. If you miss church, you've got to get that straightened out. If you're going to be saved, you've got to be baptized. I'm sorry, what about the thief on the cross? Oh, well, maybe he was an exception. The truth is, we do have to be baptized. So what kind of baptism are we talking about? The spiritual baptism, right? That very moment that you were baptized, did something happen in your life, or did you have to wait for something else to happen before anything else happened? That very moment you were baptized, what happened to you? I mean, that you were baptized by the Spirit, what happened to you? You were born again, and the Spirit indwells you now. You have the third person of the Trinity living within you right now, helping you to discern, to have the right kind of discernment and understanding of God's perfect will in your life, but you've got to feed it. God doesn't force it upon us. We have to feed ourselves, don't we? Take time in the Word of God. Take time in prayer. Most of all, trust, believe, and know that He's in control of all things, and it's not easy all the time. Yes, let us consider the counterfeits. We see the biggest thing that you can use to do that is when anything has to be added to it. You have to add something to it. You have to be good. You have to do this. You have to do that. And that's what you find. It requires works, in other words. And you know something? That's insulting to God, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How can anyone add to the works of our God? How can anyone add to His perfect work? You're never 98 or 99% there and not quite there. It is a gift of God. And we need to keep that in mind. But the grace of God that brings salvation has shown us that God has done everything for us. It's, it's a complete work. There's a great difference between the faith that has been revealed from heaven and the faith that originates with men. What am I talking about there? Well, This is God's word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Salvation comes through belief, through faith, and trusting in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It? There's, there's no other way. There's no other. The man part is where man says, well, I've got my own relationship with God. I know how God is. Okay? And in my, it might not, it's not you, but I have a special relationship with him. How often have you heard that from people? They don't need the God of the Bible. They got their own God of the Bible in their mind. That's a false religion. And we need to be careful of those kind of things when people start adding to the Word of God, things that are needed. Yes. The secret reality is righteousness is apart from the law and righteousness is apart from all human doing. Christianity is the faith that, that is based upon the faith of, the, of, of belief. The, those that believe God's word. And that, and that work was fully done and completed at Calvary. Remember what Jesus said at Calvary? That's it. It is finished. It is finished. Complete. It is done. You, nothing else needs to be added. It's, it's finished and it's done. Is the righteousness without the law is imparted from you. It's apart from human character. Is a righteous without even the consideration of the nature of being that, that, that is made righteous. Is the righteousness that comes from God upon ungodly men. Is the righteousness that will save a thief on the cross. Is the righteousness that is prepared for you and for me, for everyone who has this opportunity. It is a righteousness that one must choose 
by abandoning any hope of salvation that is of oneself or that could be produced by oneself. These are important things to see. By abandoning any hope of salvation that is of oneself or that could be produced by oneself. It is all of God, isn't it? It's God's righteousness. It is the only righteousness that can, that can produce practical righteousness in us. Now looking at verse 22 through 24, it goes on to say here, Word of God says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and being justified freely by His grace to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see, our case is hopeless, as we've already seen. So, if we're going to be saved, it must be by some other way that suits our lost condition. Paul shows that God had a plan for salvation. First, we've seen, as we approach it in verse 22, is since we cannot save ourselves, God will save us by giving us a perfect righteousness, even the righteousness of Christ, if only we will put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only condition for salvation, isn't it? Is belief, trust, you might use those two words, however you want to use them, in Jesus Christ, of putting Him in there and asking Him to save you, recognizing that you are lost and without hope, but He's ready to save you if you're ready to be saved. And of course, I'm going to read where all of us know 8, 9, and 10 of, of Ephesians chapter 2. But it's, I think it's good for us to just think on this this morning as we're studying this. How beautiful these words are. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he hath loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by Christ you are saved, and have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now, before I finish that, I want to just show you a couple of things, things that have always stood out to me and just are so beautiful to consider. Please notice, and when I read this, it says, and have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. My friend, do you understand what, that, what he's saying there? He's saying that the moment you became saved, when God looks at you, what does He see? He sees you in the heavenlies. You're already there. All has been paid for by Jesus Christ. Now, you and I know we're still in the world. And we have a purpose here in the world. A privilege more than a purpose even, if you want to call it that. To serve our Lord. To be of use. He doesn't need us for anything, does he? Does he need you or me? Can he not do whatever he wants to do? But it pleases him to use an old stick like me. Or you. To do his work. And that's what he has for us. It's so rich. And then he wants us to understand so we don't boast. He says, for by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift. A gift. Is a gift? What is a gift? You know, they gave me a nice Christmas gift last year. He gave it to me. You haven't been back over to my house to ask for it or anything else, have you? Because it was a gift. It was done. It was all complete, wasn't it? That's what a gift is, isn't it? No obligations, no anything. It's done. It's a gift of God. And to make sure we understand it and how important this is in the gospel, he goes on to say here, not of works. It can't be of works. Nothing to do with works. And why is the reason? Lest any man should boast. That's a serious thing, isn't it? And he goes on to say, For we are his workmanship, workmanship created in, 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 uh, in, in Christ Jesus unto good works, which, ha, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Yes. You see, the idea of works does not result in salvation, does it? You can't be saved through works. But they do result from salvation. There's good works in our lives because, of our, because we've been saved by, by the Lord. Second, God's plan of salvation is suitable because it is universal. Why? Well, all have sinned. We're all in the same situation. And our salvation is also universal. 
It's the same for any of us, how we should be saved. Sin is anything that comes short of the glory of God. It is the failure to meet the divine standard, and this is anything that is short of the perfect will of God. Sometimes that's hard to remember. I'm going to try to finish up here. I'm real close. But we want to remember something. God's standards are not man's standards. There are men that in the eyes of the world that appear righteous. But you know something? These are the world's eyes. But they're not the Lord's eyes. Not by God's standards. Thank the Lord for all of sin. God has made a way of escape through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word justified or just or, or just or, or just or justified or, or ju- justification simply means to justify is to declare right, just to be declared right. And we know that that happens. Justification is an act of God when He pronounces a sinner to be righteous because of the sinner's faith in Christ. We are justified, declared righteous at the very moment of our salvation. Jesus finished the work required of our justification on the cross since we have now been justified by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Romans 5, 9 says, Much more then, because now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of him. He was raised to life from justification. Romans 4, 5, 25 says, who was delivered from, for our offenses and was raised again for our sanctification. I have not just a, just a tad bit more, so I'm going to try to squeeze it in. We'll take just a minute or two more. We see this. I hope this, I hope this is uh, as good as it, it's, as it was for my study. God the Father sees us as perfect and unblemished, and we are to be, to be devoted to doing what is good. Titus 3.14 the Lord Jesus Christ has fully discharged us, discharged all charges against us. Moreover, He has given us a perfect standing before God so that we are fully accepted in His sight. One last point, and this is important. It's remarkable that the righteousness of God will not come to the one that has faith in God. And you think, what, well, Bruce, I... Well, that doesn't sound right. Think about this just a minute. If one is to have the righteousness of God, one must have faith in Him. The Him is who? Jesus Christ. It must come through Christ. And of course, Jesus Christ is God. So you can make that sense there. But there's many people running around today talking about how they're saved or what they're doing, and it's all of God, and it's not of Jesus Christ. It's not they've received Jesus or understood the finished, complete work of Jesus Christ on the cross. They have denied Him. We see that with the Pharisees when we look in the, uh, look in the, uh, uh, in the um, Gospels. How they, oh, we're of God. And He said, if you don't know God, you don't know Me. Jesus said real simply, He says, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. And no man cometh unto the Father except by me. There's one door. you got to come the way the Bible teaches. There isn't some other way to come. These are just some basic truths as we begin to start our study. He also said in John 14, 7, he says, If you'd known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Yes, Jesus Christ is God. If you know the Father, you must know the Son. If you know the Son, you know the Father. If you don't know one or the other, you don't know either. Number one, they're one and the same. So that's absolutely essential. With that, will you close this, Homer, please, this morning, brother?